Good morning from Washington, DC, and good day to you wherever you are. A warm welcome to all of you who are joining us for this month's virtual program entitled Cyberspace Security Priorities for Africa's National Security Actors. We're delighted to have nearly 100 registrants from over 30 African countries. So a very, very warm welcome. My name is Nate Allen, and I am Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. And I'm the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber issues and for this program as well. Um, before we continue with the today's program, it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Onquist Knopf, our director, to say a few words of welcome to our participants. And I'd also like to really thank Kate for all her guidance and leadership in formulating the, the cyber program. There's an awful lot that even though Kate is often doing these introductions, there's so much that goes on uh, behind the scenes and Kate has been a huge kind of intellectual force in, in shaping the direction of this program. So, so thank you to Kate and over to you to, to welcome our, our participants for this program. Well, thank you, Nate, and uh, a warm welcome, good day uh, to all of our colleagues who are joining us online. Uh, thank you uh, if you're a first time participant here with the Africa Center uh, and a uh, warm uh, uh, welcome back uh, to all of our alumni who are joining us uh, for this program. Uh, many of you know, but uh, uh, the Africa Center serves as a forum for research, uh, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas uh, with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges the Africa Center provides opportunities to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by engaging together, African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. In this kind of dialogue uh, infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, as we're going to hear across this program, uh, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. And so these are our hopes uh, and our mission uh, for our time together over the next few weeks as we meet in plenary session uh, and discussion groups to consider the cyberspace priorities for national security actors in Africa. Uh, thank you uh, to our panelists today, to Noel, uh, and uh, in advance uh, to Nate and uh, Dr. Luca uh, for guiding us through the start of this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Welcome to you all. We hope that you'll get to know the Africa Center through this process, and we look forward and value continuing our relationship together, even once we're finished. Thank you, Nate. Back to you. Thank you very much, Kate. And I'd just like to echo Kate's warm words of welcome to our alumni and our nominees who are joining us from across the continent. It's a pleasure to be able to convene and, and discuss with you uh, cyber issues uh, today. Um, so before I turn things over to our uh, Accuracy Center Dean, Dr. Luca Qual, I'm gonna take a little bit of time to introduce the content format and ground rules for our entire month we have here together. So. This virtual academic program is gonna consist of four weekly themes over the course of which we hope to first expand understanding to national and citizen security posed by the spread of information technology and also to identify key priorities for African defense and national security actors in responding to these threats. These four themes that we're gonna discuss each week include first, we're gonna begin this week by discussing Africa's cyber threat landscape, where we'll consider the scope, scale, and likely evolution of the security challenges posed by the continent's digitization. Next, we're gonna discuss key elements of what a national response to these threats are, and the degree to which these responses are being adopted across Africa. Particularly, we're gonna consider the role the security sector ought to play as part of national cyber policy. In the final two sessions, 
we're going to hone in on processes, lessons learned, and insights with respect to the security sector's role in two particularly important areas of the national response. In the third session, we're going to hear and discuss insights on critical infrastructure protection and national infrastructure and national incident response. And in the fourth session, we will discuss national cybersecurity strategy development with colleagues from Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and Kenya. Um, as we will, as every week, and as a standard format for Africa Center academic programs, we're going to begin today with a plenary session that includes a moderated discussion with the panelists, followed by a question and answer period with participants. This is going to be followed tomorrow by a smaller group discussion led by expert facilitators, where we will all have the opportunity to react to what we hear in today's plenary, to share experiences, and, and ultimately to learn from one, one another in order to catalyze strategic solutions and changes, as Kate said in her intro. Finally, with respect to the ground rules, the moderated panel discussion of today's plenary is on the record and will be posted on the website. However, the question and answer session, as well as the discussion groups, are strictly not for attribution to allow for frank, open dialogue and exchanges. I very much hope that each of us will take advantage of this opportunity to learn from and compare perspectives regarding the continent's growing cyber challenges and threats. So with that introductory, with that course intro out of the way, I'm really delighted to move into the role of panelist and to turn things over to Africa Center Dean, Dr. Luca Qual, Dr. Luca, as we, as we say, who will moderate today's session. Um, in his role as Dean, uh, Dr. Luca has been in, provided incredible guidance critical feedback and tireless leadership in shaping this program, as well as the Africa Center's broader efforts around cyber issues writ large. So I'm very pleased to have him moderate today's discussion. Uh, Luca, over to you. Oh, okay, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Ned, uh, thank you very much and uh, for your introduction and for Kate for providing us the scope of the uh, Africa Center. We are delighted today Having this first um, um, uh, seminar on the on the on the cyber security, and for us is a very important, as Kate mentioned, is a very line of work that we would like really to to sharpen and then to 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 socialize on the continent. As as Nate mentioned, uh, uh, this 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 week uh, we are going to focus on understanding Africa's emerging cyber threats. And, and this is ex extremely very important uh, discussion because the national security dimension of the threat posed by the spread of information technology in Africa are not only uh, given the attention, they are, not, they are not given the due attention they deserve. Outside of the Africa, there is an enormous discussion both in the policy and academia of the cyberspace as a growing medium of conflict, cohesion, and the cooperation. In Africa, there is virtually no scholarship on this topic, and a tendency by senior policymakers who work on peace and security issues to think of cyber as a technical issue that is of most concern to the information technology, technology expert on, on or the business community. On the basis of this, we want to devote our discussion today to take some time to better understand why national security actors you are should take a cyber threat seriously and to discuss what some of the some of these threats are. We have three main objectives for this uh, session. First, to describe the scope and the scale of the cyber threats African countries face. And we hope to focus particularly on four key threats that are of significance to national security actors. And have been featured both in our research and programming on cyber issues at the Africa Center. And I would really would like to refer to the a good work done by my colleague, uh, Ned, and I think it's one of the re reading material that you'll, you'll have uh, in your uh, reading materials. And these threats are 
including espionage or surveillance, a critical infrastructure sabotage, organized crime, and com combat innovation. The second objective is we hope to explore how the nature of these threats is likely to change due to the African continent's uh, rapid digitalization and the diffusion of the key technologies. And the third objective, we hope to get a concrete sense of these threats by discussing the significance and challenges faced in the context of Africa, of South Africa. And today we have somebody, a seasoned expert on South Africa. So we have a very seasoned experts uh, uh, of today's session. People with a lot of experience to address cyber threats from transnational organized crime in African government agencies in the security sector and in multilateral organization. They have their, your, their bios are with you. I need not to, I need not to, to exhaust you with all the, their bios. Please have a look at them, at the, at the bios. But let me start first to introduce the, uh, the panelists. First, we are privileged today to have Noel Colling. She's a researcher and a lecturer in the Department of Strategic Studies at Stellenbosch University. And she is specialized in cyber strategy, warfare, and asymmetric armed conflict. And she served as a chair of the School of Geospatial Studies and Information System Program and program lead for cyber at the University Center Institute for Governance and Leadership in Africa. She has published widely on cyber strategy and conflict in Africa and contributing in immensely to numerous peer review journals, publication, and organized and hosted a number of international conferences and events. And she was recently selected as one of the 50 most influential female, female cyber security professional in Africa. Dr. Noel, you are most welcome and we are honored having you today with us. And I am hopeful that the participants will learn from you and they will get a lot of you. The, the, second, is, the second speaker or the panelist is Dr. Nathaniel Allen. I will be referring him to Ned, okay? is my colleague in the Africa Center. He is assistant professor of security studies with the, with the Africa Center. Importantly, he's a term member with the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the faculty lead of this program. And uh, as he mentioned earlier, uh, beside that, he's also a faculty lead on peace support operation in, uh, in a peace operation. Before joining the Africa Center, he was a policy advisor at the United States Institute of Peace and has also spent time with the U United States Department of State and House Foreign Affairs and Armed Service Committee. He received his PhD in African Studies from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and has published widely on issues of emerging technology civil military relation and irregular warfare in Africa. So I'm really delighted of having such a very seasoned expert on cyber uh, security on the continent. So let me turn now to our conversation. And I would like to start first with, uh, with Dr. Uh, Allen, or I will try to call him my here with my, 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 my friendly name as Ned, okay? I just want to refer, I prefer to call him like that, but anyhow, it's Edgar Allen. Maybe within five minutes. It would be good, I, we know that uh, Ned, uh, uh, we know we recognize the threats of cyber threats on, on the continent. But I would like to really, because there are a lot of jargon, a lot of concepts, but I would like really to, clarify some of these concepts and some of these jargons in a simplified way so that our participants let us have a very 
level field ground for our understanding and perception of these concepts. So what is cyberspace? And how is the spread of information technology affecting conflict, coercion, and interstate relations in Africa? Please, you have the floor for five minutes, uh, Dr. Allen or my friend, uh, Annette. You are welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Luca, and I'm more than happy to be called uh, Dr. Nate by you. That seems to be the Africa-centered tradition that the faculty get, eventually end up getting called by their first names. Um, so Luca, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that point. And what I'm actually going to do is discuss two ways in which I think, uh, two different ways of thinking about cyberspace. And each of these ways I think has important and distinct national security implications. So the first and most straightforward way of thinking about cyberspace is simply as the spread of computer and information networks. There's a definition in one of the course readings by the Geneva Center for Security Governance that I think gives a very reasonable definition of cyberspace, which is an environment created by both physical and virtual components where data, information, or communication is stored, modified, or exchanged. And when we think about what this conception of cyberspace means for the threats, well, you have to think about what types of vulnerabilities are inherent in computer networks. And, and physical networks. And there are really three different types of vulnerabilities. First, there are attacks that compromise the confidentiality of networks using keyloggers, for example, to steal passwords. Second, there are attacks that compromise access to information networks. So the shutdown of physical ICT infrastructure or using a botnet to conduct a denial of service attack would be attack against access. And finally, there are attacks that compromise or manipulate the integrity of data stored on a network, such as using a worm or Trojan to delete or manipulate files. This confidentiality, integrity, and access is called the CIA triad by uh, cybersecurity experts, or for CIA, and it's the core of what cybersecurity professionals consider to be their work. And there's a really straightforward uh, implication from this straightforward definition on, 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 the, security on the security implications. Um, it is the more dependent we become on information networks for every aspect of our daily lives, the more vulnerable we are to these kinds of computer-based attacks. And this is of obvious concern to African security sector officials and African government officials more generally. Uh, internet penetration has increased from virtually nothing around the year 2000 to between a quarter and a third of the population today, and is projected to rise to as much as three quarters of the population by 2030. So as digitization increases, most assuredly, more African governments, more African militaries, and more African citizens will be vulnerable to these kinds of computer-based attacks. However, I think there is a somewhat deeper way to understand cyberspace and its geopolitical consequences, and that's to focus less directly on cyberspace as a network and the vulnerabilities of these networks, and more, of cy and more on cyberspace and, and information technology as enablers of other kinds of technology. Uh, you know, the common way that we talk about cyber weapons in, in the strategic studies community is as uh, a metaphor or as a in their relationship to nuclear weapons. And the most common strategic concept we use to discuss cyber strategy is often deterrence. And I actually think both of these are really deeply misleading. So I would argue that, that information technology is more akin to a basic invention like steam power or electricity than it is to nuclear weapons, which don't really create other kinds of technologies. Um, and it's a technology that by drastically decreasing the costs of communicating, collecting and storing information is enabling a host of other new technologies from virtual technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning to more physical technologies that draw on computers and sensors and networks like mobile phones, CubeSats and drones. And I think we have to think more broadly about how these kinds of technologies are affecting the global balance of power if we want to understand and unpack the national security implications. And what connects many, if not most, of these technologies is that they're low cost and they're very rapidly diffusing. That is, the, the cost to design a piece of malware or an artificial intelligence algorithm, for example, is mostly intellectual. And once created, it can costlessly diffuse. This offers African actors and African states in particular 
opportunities to acquire, adopt, and use these technologies in ways that simply wouldn't be possible with a really expensive, complicated technology like nuclear weapons. Um, finally, I, I don't think that deterrence is the greatest concept to describe how cyberspace is impacting global geopolitics. I actually think there's a growing consensus in the academic community that while cyber weapons can have physical effects, cyberspace itself has increased the efficacy of information-based ways and means of coercion, particularly with respect to things like covert action and coercive statecraft. And you know, most warfare that we find in Africa is internal, and it's, it's kinds of conflicts where I think persuasion, access to, and control over the population matters more often than whichever side possesses superior physical and technological capabilities. You know, one could even argue, I think, that African actors are more familiar with and more experienced in information-based methods of war and coercion than they're often given credit for. So I think we have to keep those, those two conceptions of cyberspace in mind and what they might mean for, for power and conflict and coercion, uh, both globally and in an African context. And that's my answer. Back to you, Luca. Oh, 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 thank you very much, uh, Dr. Allen. And uh, I think the most important thing I hope our participants will be at least now aware what is the cyberspace and how the spread of uh, information technology affecting conflict cohesion and interstate relation in Africa. But I would like really to follow up this, um, your first uh, contribution really to zoom in to discuss now more on the specific threats threats and the threat actors that we should be concerned about in the cyberspace so my real question is what are the africa african continents uh, central cyber related threats and challenges and it would be good if you could give us in terms of the cost, uh, that would be good beside also narrating the, uh, the threats and challenges, but in terms of costs as well. Uh, if, I would appreciate you can just uh, uh, share with the participant within seven minutes. Yes, so thank you. Go. Thank you very, very much, Luca. So first of all, I say, I don't think that the kinds of challenges and threats the African continent faces from a cyber perspective are all that different from the rest of the world, although they differ from country to country and context to context. And to get really simple, straightforward, and concrete, and you can read a little bit more about this in the evolving threats piece that Luca mentioned most recently, I think there are four basic kinds of threats that African national security actors need to be concerned about. One clear threat comes from espionage which is where malicious actors use malware or create backdoors in a network's physical infrastructure with the intention of stealing sensitive information. Uh, this is from a cybersecurity perspective, an attempt to violate the confidentiality of the information stored on a computer network, referring back to what I said earlier. And you know, until recently, the most pu well-publicized case of espionage uh, in Africa concerned China's alleged attempts to spy on the African Union through its, its using its status as a, a supplier of physical and network infrastructure. But particularly in recent years, we have seen the proliferation of cheap malware available from suppliers of all kinds, all different countries across the world. And I think it's likely that, that those, those capabilities are being used by states across the continent for espionage purposes. We just learned, for example, that 600 or so of the 1,000 phone numbers revealed to be compromised by uh, the Israel-based NSO, Israel NSO group's Pegasus malware uh, reportedly belonged to government officials, cabinet secretaries, and heads of state, including a few in Africa. So a majority of the numbers that they were able to identify. And since a number of African countries are clients of the NSO group and use Pegasus malware, I think we can probably connect the, connect the dots with respect to what's going on. Um, a second threat comes from critical infrastructure sabotage. It's possible to use malware to attack the integrity of information within a computer network, leading to physical destruction. This is a more technically difficult form of computer-based attack, or often is, because in order to sabotage a system, you often need specific knowledge of how it is engineered, which makes this not just a problem for software developers. So for example, Stuxnet, the software that sabotaged Iran's nuclear program, was designed specifically to disable a certain kind of industrial control system used in nuclear centrifuges. 
So most African states don't possess the same, the, 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 the same kinds of information technology infrastructure found in more industrialized countries, which you could argue makes them less vulnerable. But I also think that a lack of cyber awareness, a reliance on foreign supply technology, um, the existence of multiple pieces of signal points of failure across the cognitive infrastructure that if it failed could have cascading consequences um, are very clear sources of vulnerability. And I think the most vulnerable systems that are, are at this point pretty regularly subject to various forms of attack include government and military systems, telecommunications networks, the financial sector, and in light of last week, I would add uh, ports to that list as well. Um, over the last week, we saw a, a cyber attack against um, Transnet, who operates ports across South Africa. That attack is estimated to have cost $1.3 billion in damage. And had it gone on for a little bit longer, the cost could have been in, in tens of billions. It could have significantly impacted the economy of the entire region to give you, to give you a specific kind of concrete fact about, about the costs, Luca. Um, a third threat, and probably the one that is most concerning to African officials I know, is the threat from organized cyber-enabled crime. Um, it's important to put the emphasis on organized here. This is because it's, it's no longer really the case, if it ever was, that the biggest threats to cyber, uh, to cyber, in cyberspace come from you know, teenage hackers or lone hackers. Um, rather, it's from organized criminal groups known as advanced persistent threats, often with direct ambiguous or loose linkages to state actors who are organized more like businesses or mafias. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, so, so that's, that's the threat. Um, and I would argue that, that we wanna think broadly about how, organized, how, how cyberspace is influencing organized crime across Africa, I would, I would say there are three main ways. First, it's led to entirely new forms of criminal networks and organizations, particularly around um, uh, those that are organized around committing uh, cyber crimes like fraud and extortion. Second, it has changed how networks and markets for organized crimes like drug trafficking, arms sales, and human smuggling uh, buy and sell their goods, mainly as a result of social media and the online marketplaces. And finally, it's changing how organized criminals in Africa and across the world through things like cryptocurrency, things like mobile money, it's changing how they are financing themselves and laundering money. Um, one estimate uh, there's an estimate that, that cyber crime costs Africa as much as $3.5 billion a year. I think because most incidents go unreported, this is likely an underestimate. And just to give you a sense of how rapidly these kinds of groups have grown and the kinds of threats they pose, I'd like to recall an observation made by Stefan Conan, a former Ivarian official, uh, in our last webinar. He observed that there are virtually no in-person bank robberies in Cote d'Ivoire anymore because mobile money accounts now vastly outnumber brick and mortar bank accounts. And as a result, the business of fraud and extortion is more or less moved completely online. The fourth and final threat, Luca, uh, comes from what I would call combat innovation. So the internet and the social media on the one hand have changed how violent groups, violent non-state actors recruit, finance themselves, organize and commit violence. And it's also changed the state response. You know, we've seen in Libya, for example, the emergence of drones, um, both commercial off-the-shelf drones and drones manufactured by states becoming widespread in, in conflict zones across the world. And just the one, one observation I wanna make here is, I think it's important to note from a combat perspective, I don't think in, in information technology inherently privileges either state or non-state actors, I think despite popular perceptions. I think what really matters is how information technology is used. So for Al-Shabaab, for example, the internet has been a double-edged sword. It was one of the first terrorist groups to capitalize on the use of Twitter, which it used a pretty devastating effect during the 2014 Westgate mall attack. But after a number of Al-Shabaab's key leaders were killed, likely as a result of having their communications on their mobile devices monitored, there was a period in which the group forswore the internet altogether. Um, similarly, as we've learned for state actors, um, having a technological edge just does not guarantee victory in combat. And I think insofar as it removes the understanding of combatants from what is actually happening on the ground, information technology can be a source of, of friction, confusion, and a lack of understanding of the, of the strategic situation. So I'll, I'll end there. Just a reminder, the four threats are espionage, critical infrastructure, sabotage, organized crime, and combat innovation. Luca, back to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, yeah, uh, 
um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Allen. I, I just wanted to, to pick up what you said. I, thank you very much, at least for mapping for us the, uh, the, the cyber threats, but the, uh, the actors in the, in the cyber space. And, and the most important thing to just to echo what you said is that a three clear cyber threat that facing Africa or the continent. Uh, espionage uh, in terms of the surveillance and then the critical infrastructure in terms critical infrastructure sabotage, organized crime and combat uh, innovation. And these are very, uh, very critical points, and I think you elaborate them in a very, in a very, in a very good way. The, the last question, really, I want to conclude is uh, within five minutes: is uh, uh, what do you think the uh, the uh, what are the main opportunities and challenges for African countries? in terms of mapping these threats or the actors, but importantly in addressing these threats. And I just want to echo what you said earlier, what you have provided, you have provided also in terms of actors, but what the, what the security actors they will be able to do, whether it is a police, intelligence or military. But this is a specific question to conclude is, 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 is what are the opportunities and challenges for the African countries to map and anticipate these threats and actors, as well as addressing these threats and dealing with these actors in the cyberspace. Uh, Alan, within five minutes, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Luca. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about how African states can improve their threat assessment capabilities, and then I'm going to talk about some of the other opportunities and challenges. So uh, I think the first step when it comes to gathering better threat information and assessment is establishing something like a computer security instance, incident response team, which we'll talk about later or in, later in the program, or an intelligence fusion cell, an entity that is basically responsible in real time for monitoring a country's internet traffic and looking for cyber related threats. But I think a big challenge that a lot of countries who have uh, emergency response teams face right now is not just getting that threat information, but also getting it into the hands of strategic level decision makers and presenting them with an actionable decision. Um, all too often, critical information that might prevent an attack against, say, a government network or a bank, for example, is collected but not acted upon in a timely manner. Another really big problem is, 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 is a private sector is really important partner in here and oftentimes has visibility into threats that the public sector doesn't. So in order to get that information, you often need trust um, with the private sector. You know, cybercrime is estimated to cost $3 billion a year or more, yet most incidents go unreported. And I think in, until that happens, until there's better trust between government and private sector, between government and representatives from other sectors, you're probably going to have difficulty getting a good, a good threat, overall kind of threat assessment. Um, on your questions about the opportunities and, and, and challenges, I think the greatest opportunity that African governments face is the same as the greatest challenge. And that's has to use information technology to address at once both citizen security and cybersecurity, or cybersecurity and citizen security. So to address cybersecurity challenges are gonna require a lot of things we're gonna talk about over the course of the next four weeks, investments in cyber capabilities, policies, strategies, legal frameworks. It's gonna require lessening reliance on external actors to supply technology and ICT infrastructure and to leverage public and private sector partners to cultivate African owned technologies. But it's also gonna require making basic investments in education and digital literacy and in power infrastructure. Um, one thing that's often missed by, by non-cyber experts is that you can't use information technology without basic literacy or access to a reliable power source. And this is a massive problem in a country, in a, in a, in a region where uh, about half the, the population still lacks access to electricity. Um, but I think this is crucial and really challenging. It's gonna require efforts to adopt and use information technology in ways that serve the interests of citizen security. Um, you know, often either cyber issues are ignored by senior leaders altogether, or they're framed in ways of responding, just responding to threats. And I think unlike many other technologies, information technology is, uh, because it's an enabling technology, because it's so central to what we are doing, 
increasingly what we do. It, it has the capacity to fundamentally shape and change the social contract between the state and its citizens. And I really worry that by just embracing technology and technological solutions from smart cities to biometric ID systems, as a, uh, um, without thinking through how this relationship really affects the social contract, the relationship between the government and its citizens, um, can be ineffective at best and, and counterproductive at worst. Um, if African countries don't invest in information technology in a way that upholds the social contract and, and, and helps to foster trust, accountability, and transparency between the government and its citizens, I worry that the results are just going to be destabilizing. And just, just one final thought, if I may, Luca, I think that many African countries are at a critical juncture in their journey towards cyber maturity. The decisions you make about how your countries use information technology are gonna have repercussions for decades. And perhaps the main reason we're gathered here for this program is to try to talk about how we can ensure that Africa's digital revolution doesn't have the same result as the industrial one nearly over 150 years ago. And I think it's gonna be up to you all as leaders to leverage information technology in ways that make your countries more prosperous and more, peaceful, more, uh, and more prosperous and more peaceful. Thank you, Luke, all in there. Oh, 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 uh, 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 Ned, thank you very much. I think you have really managed to highlight three points, which I would like to highlight. One, you managed to, to clarify this jargon, what is the cyberspace? And uh, the second, wh what are the security, what are the cyber uh, threats and actors? And the last one, the uh, opportunities of developing cyber capabilities in terms of mapping and anticipating, but also addressing the cyber and uh, the cyber threats on the continent and the opportunities available for the continent. And I think I like the way you concluded, the way you, the, the social contract between the state, private sector, and the and the and the security actors and the society and the private sector, in forging a social contract of how to to map and anticipate these threats, but equally important how you could collectively be able to, to address the, uh, and to confront the, the, the cyber threats. So le le let me now, so thank you very much, uh, 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 Ned, for, for such an elaborate, uh, and I would like you to yield the participant, there is, um, it's not to market my colleague uh, publication, but it's one of the very outstanding uh, publications, Spotlight by the Africa Center on the cyber. Uh, cyber security, uh, main cyber threats. So please, it's uh, one of the main the main reference that I would like you really to to refer to. Uh, let me now move to the uh, to Mr. Pauling, uh, and I think we mentioned it earlier. I think she's a very a seasoned expert on the cyber security, experience of 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 twenty years or more on the in research. Uh, on the cyber, on the cyber security and information technology. So we are really happy having her with us today, and uh, and I, I would like to see how best we can get out of her in order to share with you her experience uh, today. So, Miss Colling, I just want to base on the discussion and what uh, what what uh, what Nate uh, discussed about the 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 cyber space the cyber threats and actors and the challenges and opportunities. I want to really to move in for you as a seasoned experts and to, to zoom in and, to, and to, to link it to the context of the, uh, of the uh, on the South Africa, but within the context of the continent, how would you characterize South Africa cyber threat landscape and how do you expect this threat to evolve in the future? And this question is not only to the South Africa. South Africa is a microcosm for the continent. And I would like you really, if you can link it to what, 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 uh, what, what Nate and uh, uh, Dr. Allen said, and link it and then zoom in it to the uh, so South Africa. I'm just calling you are welcome in seven minutes, please. Thank you, Dr. Luca, and thank you to the Africa Centre for having me um, this afternoon. Yes, so I think picking up from where Nate was, um, I'd like to talk 
briefly about Africa's strategic cyber threat landscape and, and then South Africa specifically. And I think um, it's very important as we go forward and coming back to your point, Dr. Luke, about cyber is a hot topic all over the world. And everywhere that you go, you see governments engaging with, with this issue, but in, in Africa, we're, we're not prioritizing it. So I think we need to, to first look at, at what, what is happening in terms of um, Africa's strategic security landscape and, and then understand if there are differentiators from the rest of the world. And I think it's fair to say that um, whereas in the rest of the world, I think there's quite a lot of squaring up going on for new types of warfare, um, potentially future conventional battles. Within Africa, we, we foresee low intensity armed conflict, which is very prevalent on the continent going forward, continuing, um, and low density platform centric warfare. So not a high reliance on big platforms. So where we look at African perhaps militaries being potentially um, vulnerable in terms of cyber, we, we're looking at maybe uh, air forces and navies because they're, they're more technologically dependent. But the bulk of the activity on the African continent is, is far more uh, landwards based, it's far more infantry based. So right now, I think um, that's not our predominant threat. And I think um, it's the reason I mention this is because one of the mistakes that I think we can make is looking at what's happening elsewhere in the world and what types of cyber strategies and ventures they're embarking on and adapting from them. I think we need to understand our context really well. And whatever it is that we come up with, it needs to fit our context specifically. So what we do know is that future wars in Africa are far more likely to be, well, the violence is going to be directed at civilian populations and economies rather than meeting militaries in the field as a form of hybrid type of warfare. And that cyber warfare specifically will be a vector in this type of context. And I think the potential for collateral damage to both human security and economic security is massive and quite hard to control given the difficult geography of cyberspace. So I think understanding this, um, then we, we start looking at, let's take South Africa as a case example. Where do we see South Africa right now? Well, I think um, at the outset, I think it's fair to say that the strategic situation in Southern Africa has evolved rapidly in the last 12 months. Um, we've seen um, a significant expansion in the terrorist threat in Mozambique. And we've seen uh, instability both within Iswatini and South Africa. And this means our, our strategic shape has shifted. So off the back of that, um, where does that leave South Africa? Well, the, the first thing is South Africa has a very large attack surface. Uh, cyber attack surface because we are a uh, an advanced economy. We have a, at least a medium level of cyber dependency and high cyber dependency in some of our sectors. And it's important to understand. It's important to understand where your levels of vulnerability and dependency are. They're not always the same over the entire attack surface. Um, Part of, part of our cyber dependency, I think, or cyber vulnerability might at this point be stemming from insufficient cyber skills and resource constraints, um, both across the public and private sector. Uh, what are our serious um, threats going forward? I think uh, systemic cyber attacks and then grey zone hybrid type um, operations. So systemic cyber attacks, uh, let's just dwell on that for a minute. What does that mean? A systemic cyber attack is bigger than a normal cyber attack on, let's say, a big business. A systemic cyber attack is where an attack is launched that impacts on the strategic stability of a state. And the transnet attack, which I'm going to come back to, is just such a case in point. And there are numerous cascading uh, systemic risks that stem from that att attack. And from a policymaker, governmental type level, for the people sitting on this course, I think these are the types of areas where we start focusing and asking ourselves, okay, so, um, you know, it's strategic cyber risk and differentiating 
between what the CISO or the chief information officer in a big corporate should be worried about and what somebody sitting in government should be worried about and planning for are actually uh, on different levels. And I'm going to focus a little bit here on the strategic cyber effects within South Africa. So just to briefly break down uh, our, our July, month of July, um, it was it was a pretty busy one in, in cyberspace. We, I think, had three very noticeable or notable um, cyber incidents or cyber events on a strategic type of level. The first was in what uh, the President of the Republic termed um, an insurrection. I think it's everybody knows South Africa went through uh, quite a, um, a destabilizing period during July. And one of the vectors used to fuel this instability was social media. Now, this is a specific threat to Africa, uh, social media, and I'll tell you why. It's because of the way social media is moderated and governed by the technology platforms, the owners of those platforms. They use algorithms in the background to pick up inflammatory or inciting types of statements and then pass that off to moderators who will then look at that and decide whether to deplatform somebody or give them a warning. However, those algorithms do not work in African indigenous languages. So they're not capable of picking up these types of levels of incitement and inflammatory statements and so on. So that's already a problem. Secondly, the moderators need to understand the context of African politics in each state in order to understand what is, is problematic. So, so there alone, we, we had a big problem with tech platforms not reacting to reaches out from the South African government to say, listen, you know, things are going really wild here. Um, so that was one issue. And I think it's an ongoing issue for Africa in general that we'll need to, to decide how we're going to deal with. Then we had the issue of Pegasus, which Nate has, has um, already alluded to. Uh, President Ramaphosa was one of the individuals whose name was apparently on the Pegasus list. And I think from a, the espionage of a head of state is, is a, obviously a huge concern. Um, so that, that there was that. But then coming back to the Transnet hack, and of course, this is the big one. This is the first major critical infrastructure attack in Africa. It shut down all our container ports for over a week. The, the cascading effects of this are terrible. In a lot of ways, Nate's mentioned the money, but it shakes confidence in South Africa. It pushes investors uh, towards other harbors as well as shipping lines. And we know we've got increasing competition from our neighbors who are opening up harbors. And it threatens our status as the gateway to Africa. So the ongoing long lasting effects of this are, are far reaching. Thank you. No, no, no thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Colling. And uh, as I mentioned, you, you really, a uh, few things that I would like to pick from your your the, the, the based on on what Dr. Allen said, the the overview of the cyber threats and actors, and and the challenges and and, and opportunities. What you have done is really uh, zooming in, into the uh, the cyber uh, security strategic strategic security uh, cyber security threats or actors in in that matter. And I like the, uh, the the way you you reasoned it well for the the context of South Africa, within the context of human security. And I think this is a very a very important. Uh, but also the whole the idea of the social media becoming a really a big threat to the uh, African state and how to deal with such a such a threat. I, I I would like now to move uh, within five minutes to 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 go for more discussion about. Even though we have these cyber threats in terms of threats, in terms of actors and, uh, and uh, the capabilities uh, of the African states in, in relation to the South Africa, how do these constraints limit the ability of many countries to effectively address cyber threats and how can they be overcome? But importantly, I think it would be good if you can 
in terms of capabilities, in terms of mapping these threats and actors, but also the uh, the uh, the capability for 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 the anticipation of these threats. Besides the fact that the uh, in terms of the how to overcome them. And it would be good you can map it within the context of the continent, but also in relation to the to the South Africa. So, so you are welcome uh, within five minutes. Thank you. Uh, all in here. Thank you, Doctor. So I think the first the first is to get your policy architecture correct. Um, it's very important to have fit for purpose strategies, cyber strategies, and cyber warfare, cyber crime strategies, as I spoke about before, understanding your own context. And, and coming up with policies and strategies that are relevant and speak to those contexts. Obviously, the big thing here is once you've got that on the table, implementation. You cannot sit and have it gathering dust. So implementation is key here. Another very key issue in cyber, if, you, if, we, if any of us are going to get on top of this problem, is, is public-private partnerships. And I'll probably speak more about that in the next question. Um, but I think... Creating a realistic and capable cyber workforce, this is obviously key. This is a human capital intensive industry or, or undertaking that we're busy with here. So you're not going to solve the problem with, with buying tools, buying software, et cetera. You need the people who can do this job. Uh, so that cybersecurity capacity development is absolutely essential. But also, again, I think don't get stuck in the training phase that's really important. You can train people and train them, but if they're not actually working in the wild, the training, um, they don't retain most of it. So, so it's really about getting real and getting on with it. Having a look at, um, I think, the understanding the necessity for also developing your cyber operations doctrine and so on in order to meet these threats. And one, one of the advantages, I think, that we can use as Africans is leveraging off our experience in counterinsurgency warfare or counterinsurgency operations, those asymmetric, there's, there's a lot about COIN that is quite similar to cyber. So it's not that we can't meet these threats. I think it's about getting organized and getting aligned. And very often uh, governments have quite fragmented responses to cyber threats and they'll have a pocket of excellence here and a pocket there. I think it's about bringing people together, getting your quantum of expertise together and starting to ensure that you have alignment rather than competition in order to meet these threats. What's, what's critically important here is getting your threat intelligence uh, network sorted out so that you can both understand your threat landscape, but also create actionable intelligence for your public and your private sector. This is a joint undertaking. So um, I think the very often, and you see this the world over that, People can get stuck on surveillance. It's really not about surveillance. It's about threat intelligence, understanding where your threats are going to come from and how. Uh, so that actionable intelligence is key here, but also understanding your data, collecting data, knowing what your attack surface actually really looks like, and then modeling your interventions correctly. So I think, yeah, in terms of getting going, those are, those are things that I would look at. Oh, 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 thank you very much, uh, Ms. Colin. And uh, I think this issue of the uh, the capability constraint is quite a very challenging. And uh, and what the uh, and it is good that you 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 highlighted very well. But I would like really later on to focus later on beside the um, the capability constraint and even with you with Dr. Allen, the issue of the uh, the awareness. And I think it's one of the very a limiting factor for us to to highlight and uh, but even sometime i would like this the 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 in terms of capability in terms of costing what does it mean if a country is having a limited capability or capabilities uh, in addressing the uh, the cyber threats or dealing with these uh, the cyber uh, actors the uh, cyber uh, criminal actors in the cyber space my my last question really is based on what uh, based on the on the on the uh, on the on the second question is that and based on the way you narrated to always I want to deal with you with the, not only in the context of the of the South Africa but also in the context of the of the continent given your wealth of experience 
So in your view, what role should security sector actors have in protecting or anticipating South Africa's, uh, protecting South Africa or other countries in the region from cyber threats? And do you perceive any risk in giving security sector actors too much authority or control over information security? I think the question here, what is the role of the security actors in anticipating and mapping security threats or even the criminal activities of, uh, of cyber in the cyber space? And what should be the role of the security actors? How much should we give? How much we should not? And what are the dangers? And what are the challenges? Because this is a very big challenge that we, maybe you could answer this one in five minutes. I would appreciate Ms. Colin. Thank you. Well, I think it's fair to say that the securitization of cyberspace, it's inevitable that the security actors are going to play a very big role. It's also an extremely contested adversarial domain between states. So governments obviously need to be able to mount an effective response. Uh, and in this sense, all your, your, your main security actors, your intelligence service, your military and your police have got their defined roles to play. I think um, always the general public will point out to, I think, worry about issues like mission creep, um, perhaps uh, too much surveillance or going beyond what's required. And these are certainly discussions that are had within South Africa quite openly. So, so these, these are threats. These are things, I think, that make uh, civil society uncomfortable. Um, so the state has to balance what it needs to do and the what it can with what it can do, I think, is, is the important balance here. What do you need to do? What you can do is not what you should, well, should do in terms of you, but you might have now massive power at your disposal. Um, so, so yes, this, the, these need to be firmly controlled, these types of activities, reports to, to Parliament, I think, um, but also to, to the, the, the sections don't compete with one another because um, really, if you constrain in your cyber capacity, it's actually really important that you work together, that you get that alignment correct. So, so that's one of the issues is potentially overreach in terms of the security actors, but this is definitely their job. Another thing I think that I can't really emphasize enough is, is that if we don't work with the technology community, technical community in the technology sector, we're not going to get this right. Why? Because the artifacts of cyberspace are actually owned by civilian companies. Governments rely on that infrastructure. We share those artifacts in cyberspace, <clears throat> the technology companies and governments. This is a joint undertaking, <clears throat> it's a joint enterprise, and we need a compact in order to make that work. Big technology companies that, that supply services to government and big industry, all the things that make the state work, have their hands deep in cyberspace. They're able to do things in cyberspace that governments just can't because they've had 20 or 30 years of massive investment in security. Uh, so, so this creates a bit of a departure from the norm for security sector actors in terms of having to open up and work with these private partners. But my, 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 my sense is, is if you don't do that in a well-defined, structured manner, you're not going to keep ahead of the game. So that, that requires a departure from previous thought. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's calling and uh, uh, thank you very much for the. Uh, I know one of the things, this the, the point you raised earlier about the need of having the um, the uh, the national cyber security policies and strategies as a way of how you can be able to the division of labor between the different actors of the security sector. But indeed, the security actors they do have a role to play but cautiously to be governed by law in such a way not to infringe on the, on the fundamental basic rights of the citizen. And I think this is a balance that you need to strike in terms of how much the security should be entrusted with the year. But there's no doubt the security, they do have a role in anticipating 
and mapping these security threats and the activities of the criminal actors in the cyberspace. So really thank you very much for the, uh, for the uh, your contribution. And I hope uh, for the participants, I hope uh, we have these seasoned experts and I, you might have heard them and their contribution. I would like you really, while we are having this conversation, we would like you really to, uh, uh, in case you want to ask some questions, there's a chat function that you can be able to ask your question uh, in the three languages, uh, English, French, and, and Portuguese. So really, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, uh, Alan and uh, Ms. Colling, Colling uh, for the uh, for such a contribution. Now, but let me just let me highlight some of the few points from this uh, from this session. One, I hope we have succeeded in one way or another to have uh, an idea what is the cyberspace, and I think. Dr. Allen managed to define it for us. These are the jargons we need to have a better understanding and then to be able to know what is this cyberspace. And the second, at least we have, have identified some of the key strategic cyber threats facing the continent. The four of them are very important for us to, 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 to highlight. Uh, the, uh, the, in terms of the espionage, in terms of the, um, of the surveillance, uh, critical infrastructure and uh, sabotage, organized crime, and combat uh, innovation. These are four key uh, threats that we may need to link to these threats are the actors that are involved. And the, the other point is the real vulnerability and fragility of African countries that they face as a result of low level of cyber awareness. I think this is a very important, the cyber awareness is a, beside the threats, the, uh, the capability, but even the awareness of the, uh, of the, and the lack of digital literacy and capabilities. And the last point is the crucial role that the security actors have to play, not only in anticipating and mapping the cyber threats, but even responding to these threats, but also in ensuring that they are addressed in a manner consistent with citizen security and fundamental rights of the citizen. So this is what we are coming out of this, uh, um, the, uh, this session. And, and, and I really, I would like Yasu Sang Bo's, uh, speak, uh, the panelists, for a great job at least to start the discussion and the conversation about around these fundamental issues about the cyber threats and the landscape of the cyber security on the continent.